Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast, joined by a very special guest, Raymond Jang. How are you going, mate? Yeah, thanks, Owen. Uh, really well in Melbourne, and I'm really enjoying it. How about yourself? Yeah, mate, very good. This is your first time on the Australian Finance Podcast. You've hosted some of your own Australian Investors Podcast episodes. Tell us a little bit about, a little bit about yourself. Um, so, yeah, I started working at Rask um, back in 2021. Mm-hmm. Um, have an insolvency accounting background, and then got really passionate about investing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, just been reading a lot of books, um, listening to your Australian Investors po- Podcast episodes um, on the train to work, train back to work, at home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not that one. Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere you heard my voice. Oh, jeez. <laughs> um, but yeah, really enjoying it at the moment. So, yeah. Yeah. great. And um, what was your first investment? First investment was Rectifier Technologies. Yeah, tell us um, a little bit about this. It's a very, it's a, I'll probably call it a micro cap. Um, so it's got $50 million market capitalization. So that's very small. That's very, very small. Um, I was essentially looking for companies with a lot of free cash flow, strong balance sheet. Um, after reading, um, I think it was book, Morning Stars book, um, oh, yeah. Pat Dorsey's. Pat Dorsey's book, yeah. Yeah, five um, successful steps to. Uh, invest so yeah um so you went out and found the company that matched that criteria yeah essentially um and i was looking for a thematic as well so i knew electric vehicles was about to take off um and was just looking for something in that space so Mm -hmm. just came across this little company and it's done well so far great and touch wood (laughs) touch wood that continues yeah so you've basically read some books you've got an uh, accounting background which would help um you look at smaller companies because 50 million dollars on the share market is tiny but when you're in accounting you work with all types of businesses that might not be that big so for you that was probably okay but for most listeners they're probably thinking 50 million dollars that sounds really small when i look at apple that's like two or three trillion Mm. the company we're talking about today is in the billions Mm. and that company is zero which it's good that you've come on the show because having an accounting background um, zero sales to accountants. I know that's not kind of what, that's not really what you did, right? Like that was slightly different to the type of accounting that we're talking about today. Hmm. I think that's a really good segue because um, working in insolvency, I came across a lot of small to medium uh, businesses that went into liquidation. So at the time, um, probably the first year or second year when I started as a graduate back in 2012, um, I could see a lot of these businesses were using zero. Right. Because I had to review their accounts mm-hmm. and speaking to the directors, requesting the rec- records, um, they use zero. So it was it was very different um, to the old style MYOB, which is a direct competitor to zero still uh, at the moment. Um, but it was a very easy interface mm-hmm. and user experience for me to actually review the records. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I, I wasn't into investing at, at that point in time, but if I had been, then it would have been, well, it's always easy in hindsight, but it would have been great to- Yeah, it would have been a light bulb <laughs> moment like, oh, wow, everyone's using this zero thing. I should yeah. check out who owns it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. So in a previous episode, we talked about how people can find companies by just using their circle of competence. Um, you would have had direct exposure to zero um, through those companies going out of business. Obviously, zero makes money when they're in business mm. because they pay a monthly subscription fee. If you were if you were looking at zero just straight from the outset, what are some of the things that you would do to understand what the company does? Like, what are the the resources that you would use? Um, would you visit their website? Would you read an annual report? How would you start that initial part of your research? I think I really want to understand um, what the products and services are and what they offer. Okay. Just putting yourself in the shoes of a, a potential customer, being a business, and then 
if you're running a business, then you need an accountant. And then um, I think it's quite similar to maybe those parents out there and they're <laughs> managing kids and you've got bills to pay. So the kids are your customers and then you need a platform to manage all those things. Um, so, yeah, viewing it through that lens, I think, makes you understand, is it a valuable, you know, um, service and product that I'm going to be using? Mm-hmm. Is it important? Um, and would I pay additional money to subscribe for more features? Yep. So, yeah, because that's an important point because we'll dig into it in just a minute. But what we're seeing now is zero is growing super fast, but it's also charging more, which is interesting because like even if we go to the website, which is somewhere where I would go for something like this, we can see that there are a few different plans for small businesses. Hmm. So there's a starter plan, which is the absolute basics. You can send some quotes and get some you know, reconcile your bank statements, which is kind of like what you were using it for. Like you would bas- basically making sure that the bank statements match up with or the bank accounts match up with like the annual reports and verifying all the transactions. Mm. You can do that for $27 a month or you can go to the standard plan, which is the one that Rask's on for $54. Or then you can go up to the next one, which gives you even more. And so it's kind of like this model of what tier do you want? And then once you're in it, you want to keep paying for it because it's got all of your data. It's got Once you've put all the accounts in there, mm. you don't want to take them out and take them over to NYOB, do you? So, yeah, it's an absolute nightmare, yeah. I think, for business owners. Yeah, that's like it. They already have so many different books and records that they have to manage, um, employee records, payroll, project management. So there's a lot of documents. So having one platform makes it much easier. Yeah. And that's what we've seen over time is zero has gone from um, just a place where you just do it solely accounting to now it's HR, it's payroll, it's superannuation here in Australia. Mm. It's taxes across borders um, and uh, in other parts of the world. So it's kind of become this big platform mm. for people to use. And I think the important point there for investors is that the platform has got more valuable because they've added more features, they've added um, new ways for them to make money. A good example of this is if Zero has 3 million subscribers, if they just earn one extra dollar per month, that's an extra you know $3 million a month multiplied by 12 months a year is $36 million. But the important point is that they don't have to incur extra costs to charge an extra dollar. And that's what makes this business beautiful. Mm. Um, Pardon the pun because it's it's fra- catchphrase is beautiful accounting software. Yeah. So um, th- that's why this business is really interesting. It started in uh, 2006 by a guy called Rod Drury, who still owns a substantial amount of shares uh, in the business, but he's no longer uh, the CEO. Steve Vamos is the CEO. Mm. We'll talk about him in just a minute. Um, but the business started as cloud accounting. Interestingly, when we we're going back over some notes, because we recommended this company, and full disclosure, I own shares, but you do not. Is that correct? Yeah. So full disclosure, I own shares. We did recommend this and we do recommend this for our Rask Invest service at the time of recording. Um, Craig Winkler is still a big investor in Zero. And what's interesting about that is Craig Winkler was the MYOB founder. Oh, right. So he worked for the direct competitor who was getting disrupted and saw what Zero was doing and invested in them, wanted to buy more, didn't because Rod wouldn't let him buy anymore. And still a massive investor and um, has been selling down recently, I believe. But it gives you an insight into here's the most prominent person probably in this industry now investing in the startup because he could see that it's got a really bright future. I think that's a pretty good sign for hmm. any company. Hmm. I think that's a very important insight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in your opinion, mate, what does – if you were to describe what Zero does, because the first question on our checklist is what does the business do? Yeah. So what does it do? Well, I think the best way to describe it would be it provides the tools that you need to run a business in an easy and efficient manner. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the biggest problem it solves for business owners. Mm-hmm. Um, but as you touched upon earlier, it's also – providing additional features and not being just an accounting platform, but also um, adding functionalities like payroll. So, mm-hmm. and also um, allowing integrations from other app developers to add more analytics. Um, I think artificial intelligence is going to be a big area as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, to sum it up, I think 
going back to the family analogy, yep. it's essentially running the household budget, making sure operations are um, running smoothly. Mm-hmm. And, and keeps people in business. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like it just lets them get on with running their life. Yeah. And that's what I found with Zero too. Yeah. He's got, like, a friend of mine is a gardener and he uses Zero and he raves and rants about it. Uh, how good it is because he can just literally press a button for an invoice. Hmm. It automatically follows up with, hey, your invoice hasn't been paid. Then when it gets paid, it gets reconciled into his revenue. It automatically calculates GST. And so it's just like this whole thing all automated, which means he can just do more of his gardening and, and get on with that side of his his business. Um, and so, I, sorry, just one yeah, more thing yeah, about yeah, the business it. model. Yeah. Uh, the great thing about the business model is that as you as the business grows, their clients, Zero's clients, they need to add more users and they charge for that extra user. Yeah, really good so, point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's where it pays to pay attention to how billing happens. I think a lot of investors, when they look at companies, they don't actually, well, they know that there's revenue coming in, but they don't actually know exactly how contracts are priced or, or what have you. And sometimes you don't know, like some of the different companies won't be as clear on their website to say, this is how we charge. But some, like you say, it's like usage or it's per user or seat. And so the more users, the more money that comes in. And um, it's basically like a land and expand model where zero gets into your business and once it's in there, it can expand. But it, the, the hardest part is getting in there. Yeah. Once a family grows, when you have more once kids. Once a family then, grows, for every yeah, child you yeah, pay zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's it. So another good point about this is um, actually how zero is sold. So zero is typically sold to the accountant, which then refers it on to the customer. And the customer pays the bill. And this is really important because the accountant goes to the customer and says, well, hey, um, you could pay me 200 bucks an hour, $250 an hour, whatever. Hmm. Or we could use zero and automate a few hours of this every month for $52, Mm. you know, um, and it's a no brainer because then the customer's like, well, of course I'm going to use zero. Mm. And so for the customer, they save money for the accountant. It's easier. And so everyone kind of wins. And I think that's a, that's a really good point because it shows you how they were able to grow so quickly. Mm. Um, and so, okay. So how about then the, I guess the life cycle of the company, mate, like how would you, do you have any opinion on how the business has grown over time like and how the industry has grown? Maybe we should talk about competitors, what, where Zero operates and what it does. Yeah, competitors, it's it listed back in 2007. Yeah, I, th- I think so. In New Zealand it did. And yeah, then it New Zealand. changed to just Australia. Yeah. Uh, I think it was one or two years ago now. Yeah, experienced an extraordinary amount of growth back in, I think, maybe starting 2010, um, and mm-hmm. then the share price really moved quite a lot um, in 2013. Yeah, it did. And I think going through a couple of the announcements you know, throughout 2013, um, it was doubling revenue, doubling subscribers. And towards the end of 2013, you could see um, it, was, it was already dominating the Australian and New Zealand market. And a lot of talk was happening um, about the opportunities with um, the UK, and also um, there was a massive capital raising. Yeah. So they raised around 180, I think, New Zealand million dollars. Um, and there was a lot of talk about the the potential of zero to absolutely dominate the world. Yeah. Um, and I think it's so so important to understand you know, it's a fragmented industry in the small to medium business uh, market, mm. and I think. It's very important to consider the competitors. Um, one of the biggest competitors is Intuit. Yeah, um, Intuit, yeah. So they've got a massive first mover advantage in the US. Um, they've got a number of solutions. They've got QuickBook, um, TurboTax. Yep. It's considered to be the gold standard when it comes to processing US tax returns. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it holds 65% market share um, in the um tax software market which is huge when you think about that it's like not many companies get to that like 65 percent market share is massive yeah so that's like the gorilla in the room in the united states market yeah but for zero it's it's still okay because they have australia new zealand and Mm. the uk yeah and i think it's also worth mentioning that the u.s tax system is slightly different to the australian one in that 
it tends to be state based in the United States. So yeah. there's more complexity around which states have certain taxes and HR policies going across jurisdictions. Whereas in Australia, we tend to follow like a federal system where it's one mm. tax for the whole country, basically. Um, and you pay more taxes, you get more income and so on and so forth. So that's important. You mentioned something before about, um, this was off air, about Zero's share price and basically how we could study its valuation through time. Yeah. So I think this is important. And maybe if you break down the steps to what you mean as we go through. Yeah, I think it's very integral to understand what the community is thinking about the share price. Mm -hmm. And you can use tools like Ticker. Um, that's what we use. To, yeah, T-I-K-R. Yeah. Um, but also I think Google and also the ASX uh, provide mm -hmm. high level uh, ratios like PS uh, price to sales ratio mm -hmm. and it gives you a sense of what the market um, is thinking and what's the expectations uh, embedded in the current share price. Um, so this would be like you compare the share price of a company versus the sales per year of the company to get a ratio there. Yeah. And then you can basically say if it's higher, there's more expectations because people are bidding the share price up yeah. and if it falls, then you know that the expectations may be coming down or something like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's a very useful comparative tool mm -hmm. um, to understand how this company's uh, expectations compares to other companies. Mm -hmm. And I think it's even more useful when you're uh, using the same industry. Okay. Um, I think that's a very important insight to take away. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in 2013, the price to sales ratio was 50 times. And to provide context, that's extremely high when yeah. you compare it to a lot of other um, great companies, not mm. only in Australia, but in the world. Yeah. Um, so I think when you look at the price to sales ratio um, at a particular point in time, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important to understand the context behind it. So you want to read the, the ASX announcements in the lead up to um, those uh, valuation um, heights. So, so I've just brought it up here in front of Raymond. Yeah. So you can see in 2014, the price to sales ratio, like you said, was over 50 times. So this is like comparing, um, again, the yearly sales to the share price or the valuation of the company. We can see it's peaked like Mount Everest in 2013, yeah. 2014, and then it's come crashing back down. Yeah. But by itself, if you got the number 50, you wouldn't know that 50 is meaningful. You would have to compare it over time yeah. or to a competitor or to like the industry average, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's really important. Um, but yeah, so if you had invested some money um, in zero at that point in time, it would have taken until around 2018, November 2018, to actually make your money back right. uh, because they had dropped down um, so much over that time. Because the share price has dropped because of and the sentiment. sentiment amongst investors has meant that the ratios yeah. come right down. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and the story behind why there was such so much hype around uh, zero was because of the opportunities that we talked about before. Mm. Um, they dominate Australia and New Zealand, they're doubling revenue. They were looking to expand. Um, and also Peter Thiel, um, the co-founder of PayPal, and um, he has his own venture. He was also early invested in Facebook. Mm, so was, yep. when people follow you know, some great investors, they kind of, you, know, you hope they know it's going to be the next unicorn. Yeah. And I think a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon, so to speak. Um, so, so this, so Peter Thiel's shown interest in zero. Yeah. Then everyone's like, oh, well, this is one of the world's greatest investors. Why don't we follow what he's doing? Um, and then you see the share price rocket. And then it comes crashing back down to earth because that sentiment has kind of gone away. But in the background, I think this is an important thing to note is that in the background, zero has continued to grow. It's just that the share price has fallen. And so this is where we see particularly mistakes amongst beginner investors that the share price falls and they think, oh, the business hasn't done well enough. Hmm. But it takes many years, even for the greatest growth stories in Australia and New Zealand to execute. Yeah. And for their, you know, they had an ambition to dominate the UK, which they're still doing today. And, you know, it's like nearly 10 years on, they're still growing in the UK. Hmm. So these things don't happen overnight. But for some reason, our expectations are like, hmm. 
the next 24 months. If it doesn't, if it doesn't dominate the mm. world in the next 24 months, I'm going to sell my shares. Mm. Um, but that's not how it happens in reality, right? Mm. So we're here, we see the share price come way down. Mm. Um, but the company has continued to execute. At least that's what I would say because we've seen more users. Like I've got some numbers here from the half year results for FY 2022. Um, Three million users now or subscribers now to Zero Software globally. That was up 560,000 over the year. So meaning that they've added over half a million in one year. Mm. I remember, I, I can't remember the statistic, statistic off the top of my head, but I think it took Zero around about 10 years to get to a million subscribers. And then I think it was three years to get another million. Yeah. That's, so that's rapid growth. Yeah. So you can see how quickly that's grown. Like it's taken 10 years to get to one point, but then the next one's so much faster than the last one. And that's that exponential growth. Mm. How about one of the things that we look at, mate, is competitive advantages. Yeah. And I mentioned in a podcast with Kate that one of the things that we look at is a moat. So we're looking for a defensive barrier around a com- company. For zero, the idea, the, the, the moat that comes to mind is switching costs. Like once you have zero, you're not going to give it up. Is that how you would be looking at this in terms of its competitive advantage? Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think that's zero's biggest competitive advantage in that once a business gets so familiar with using certain tools, um, it becomes um, very hard for them to like be incentivized or be encouraged to switch over to another one. Mm. It's essentially like you using Microsoft Office or Excel spreadsheets for a very long time to do it, to do a um, to do your work, and then you're told to use something completely different. But mm. you spend a lot of time using that. Yeah. So. So it makes the transition really hard, and you're less likely to give it up. Yeah, and that's what we can see. We can see that with um, zeros numbers that they give us. It's got really high gross profit margins, so that's a sign that. It's earning a lot of revenue and the actual costs involved in putting that in place aren't that high. But then we see really low churn. So churn is like the opposite of retention. It's when people leave, they churn off. That's actually quite low as well. And it's always relatively stable, which is impressive because you think that small businesses are going out of business. We've been through COVID, yet the churn is still really low. Why would you, Do you have any insight into why churn would be low even though we've gone through COVID? Like do what would you, uh, without looking at the numbers, what would you say? I think because Xero has developed a platform that's so easy to use and it's so feature rich that it's got to a point where a lot of business owners just you know can't do without it. So yep. it's made it really hard for them to um, take it out of there. It's, it's m- mission critical. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It is. And I agree. Like it's, it's for the 50 or a hundred dollars you pay a month and what it value it creates for your business. Like there's a mismatch there between so much value created and it doesn't cost you that much. Yeah. So why wouldn't you keep it right? It's probably the last thing you'd give up. Um, okay. So let's quickly talk about management. We'd mentioned Rod Drury br- briefly before. Um, there are some other people we should know about. David Thode is, um, was probably rose to prominence f- through his role with Telstra. He's the chair of the board. Um, he's been in charge of a lot of companies over the years and in particular the board of directors now that he's a bit older. But um, he's been mainly tech focused, mainly like large blue chip, mid cap or well, medium sized companies. Um, so he's the chair of the board. Rod Drury is still on the board. We love to see founders yeah. involved or families involved. We saw uh, P- PWH or PWR Holdings. Yeah. Um, that's a company you know well. Yeah. That's a tell us quickly about this. What's the 60 second version of that? So, Peter uh, Holdings, it essentially develops uh, advanced cooling solutions. Um, so, the radiators that you put in your car, mm-hmm. but they're applying that across um, not only motor vehicles, but also um, aerospace um, and also um, military and defense. So, yeah, there's right. a lot of optionality with their with their business and mm-hmm. they've been doing that for a very, very long time. But now there's been a need to go go to space to try mm-hmm. and um, speed up um, the transfer of communication data. So um, yeah, uh, it's, it's- And that's found and, to run, right? Yeah, founded by Keyes Will, who was a pro driver. So he was very um, passionate about cars and finding solutions to help cars run, um, you know, 
more efficiently and also there's a lot of heat involved so um the cooling solutions are very niche and mm. yeah customized and that's a great example of like another founder that's has their business on the asx that runs the business um that is still involved rod doesn't run zero anymore but he's still in like he's still a non-executive director yeah um the, the person who replaced him was actually fantastic in terms, in my opinion. Uh, Steve Vamos, who's the current CEO of Zero, he spent time with Microsoft and in Silicon Valley working with global technology companies. And since he's taken over, the business has continued to scale incredibly well, but it's also been able to um, look at making acquisitions. So Zero is no longer just about like organic growth, like signing up more users. Hmm. Now, under his stewardship, the business has proven its ability to make small acquisitions of other companies to bolt into zero, mm. which is really cool. And so they are aligned, all of these people are aligned pretty well with incentives, which we can get from the annual report and also through their skin in the game or share, mm. share ownership. So again, they're tied to the long-term performance of the company. Mm. Um, these are things that we'd love to see. Yeah, I also noticed that Steve Vamos, uh, having a look at his LinkedIn profile, he's stayed at big companies for a pretty long time. So I think he was at IBM for 14 years um, across mm. general sales, marketing, management roles. So it's something you really want to look for, something who's, someone who's passionate about technology and mm -hmm. has that industry experience. Mm. And that's, that's fantastic, right? That's what we want to see because we want to see someone that has an idea for a company and they see it. Mm. Um, I had it. I heard it recently from another CEO on the ASX, um, and he said that good ideas are cheap, but good ideas well executed are very expensive. Basically, saying that if you have a good idea, it's one thing, but if you have a good idea and you actually do something about it and you make it happen, that is incredibly valuable. Mm. And Steve has been able to do that because he's been at these places for so long, um, and he knows what he's doing. And so you see a lot of professional CEOs, air quotes, professional CEOs mm. who come into businesses have a great idea, stay there for one or two years, probably make a bunch of people redundant, improve the profit, see you later, like I'm going to take my bonus and go. Hmm. And that's not what we want with a company like Zero. Yeah. So I guess there are a few things we've talked about. The industry itself is also growing. Um, we've got good management at the helm. We've got high switching costs. They've built a platform which now allows developers to build their solutions inside of it. So it's getting a wider moat over time. Hmm. One question I always get asked, Raymond, is, in the United States, why like Intuit is so much bigger and like it's a better competitor than Zero? Now you could own both shares. You could buy Intuit shares and mm. you could buy Zero shares if you really wanted to, if you believed in this so much, or you could just acknowledge that Zero is up against a gorilla in that marketplace, but it still has three hundred thousand subscribers, so it's not small. Mm. If this was, if you rewind ten years, that was probably the size of Zero. Mm. And that's how big it is in the United States, which is a massive market. So even if it doesn't win there, zero today is still going to be profitable and grow. But if it does win there, it's like embedded optionality. It's growth that could come and it could be really impressive when it does. Yeah, I think when a lot of people first start out, I think they're kind of drawn to finding the winners. And it doesn't need, you don't need to find companies that are going to be um, the number one winner. Yeah, I think um, there's an attraction to monopoly businesses. Um, monopoly meaning like there's only monopoly, one. Yeah, there's only one, and it's very dominant. So it's very similar to, um, say, Pexa Group. Um, yeah, which is the property settlements business in Australia. Yeah, yeah, and it's understandable because you can only have one system because yeah. of the way um, the you have to transfer is. property and it has yeah. to be one system for yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But at the same time, those kind of companies, like even Facebook or Google, could be considered to be monopolies in their areas. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, um, it attracts regulation. Mm. Um, regulators don't want you know one company to be controlling the whole ecosystem. Yeah. So, and zero in, into it could you know they're not they're not competing on price. Yeah. Um, so I think that's an important element to that's a good point. Uh, be mindful of. Like yeah. you don't always have to invest in companies that are just going to be number one. Yep. So, so I think so. Just to tie a bow on this, that's a really good point you make there about not competing on price. One final thing I'll add on here is how we did evaluation. So Raymond brought up um, price to sales ratio as being really important. What, when I first discovered zero, the way I valued it was I used a discounted cash flow analysis, and this was covered in our value investor program 1.0. 
And basically what I did is I got the number of users and multiplied that by the, the price of their software. So like number of subscribers multiplied by how much they pay in the subscription fee and that gives you revenue. Hmm. And I forecast that out 10 years into the future. And you can do that today. We can do that today. Um, and so the value at the time of recording, the value, the latest valuation that I'd done is I think it's, if I just get the price up, it's slightly above the current share price of 87 or $88. Um, now that changes, valuation changes through time because depending on how successful they are in the United States or the UK, that all changes. Um, but at the end of the day, oftentimes what you find with a company like Zero is you won't get to buy it for bargain basement prices. Because it is such a good company, it's very rarely thrown out with the bathwater. So if that does happen, you've got to be ready. But also sometimes you've got to be ready that you might have to pay a slightly higher price than you would otherwise like. One way I get around that, Raymond, is I actually like to buy in parts. Hmm. So I might buy a little bit now. And then if the price falls, I might buy a little bit more. Hmm. And then if it, even if it goes up, I might buy a little bit more. So I don't buy all at once. Because if you buy all at once, you kind of like you've got that price for forever. Hmm. Whereas you can monitor the story over time. So there are plenty of risks, which I'll just quickly tack on the end here. Zero um, is a high-priced technology company. The market has not been kind to technology mm. companies lately. Um, the business is, you know, is very well run, but it might not always be. So we want those management, uh, those key management personnel, to hang around for the long term. Uh, we want to make sure that the business is able to keep growing in its core markets of Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. And what I mean by growth there is increasing the price slowly over time, as well as hopefully attracting new users. Make sure that churn level is low, meaning they're not losing customers. And broadly, like if we can see some more growth in the United States, that's great. So those are some of the risks. Uh, there are many more. But Raymond, I think for you, does is where would zero sit? And I know we've like I've made it an official bias. I'm not saying that you have to do that f- for this podcast, not at all. But is it worthy of further research if you're an, even if you weren't an accountant like you have been trained by you know, by training, would you put it on your watch list? Would you consider it for your portfolio? Would you do further research? Like where would this sit for you? For me, it definitely sits on my watch list. Mm-hmm. Um, on valuation grounds, it's it's interesting. Um, mm-hmm. I would prefer um, you know, sentiment to be lower so yeah, I sure. can get it at a more reasonable price based on my uh, views mm-hmm. um, and I think it's important when when a high quality business like Zero uh, suffers a negative sentiment like this or there's a market rotation a lot of these reasons are not specific to the company mm. and when that happens you have to understand if that's truly the case um, because when there is growing negative sentiment then um, you could potentially um, if you do get the judgment of this wrong um, about the reasons why this company um, is suffering negative sentiment, then you have to have to do some extra research to make sure you're making the right judgment call. But once you've done that research, you'll be more confident in that decision. Raymond, that's a really good point and uh, a fitting way to end the conversation. If you want to send questions to Raymond, myself or anyone in the team, you can send them to podcast at rask.com.au. Use the subject line shares month and we'll be back to answer your questions on zero or on share investing in general. Raymond Jang, thanks for joining me, mate. Yeah, thanks, mate.